would like him to answer. So go ahead, put questions in the chat box, and then um, I'll try to jump in if uh, when I see them. So take it away, Greg. Thank you. Well, thanks, Chris. Thanks for the nice uh, introduction, and and thank you all for jumping on tonight. And thanks for having me. I um, I'm originally from Ohio, from Columbus. I sailed at Hoover Lake, and um, so I know Cave Run Lake. I think I was down there, and I won't tell you how many years ago it was, and did a little clinic for you guys many, many moons ago. But um, I know the kind of sailing you guys do there. I know the passion everybody has, and um, and again, I'm I'm honored that you guys invited me to come speak to you tonight. And, um, and, and Chris has shared with me kind of the breakdown of the number of racers and the number of day sailor cruisers that, that you all have. And, um, and while I'm a racer and I'm primarily a small boat racer, I'd love to be able to help. And, and I kind of went through my talk and tried to adjust it so that we can, we can help, um, or resonate, I guess you'd say, with no matter what kind of boat you're sailing. And and like Chris said, if there's a question you have, you know, even if it's very, very specific to your boat, I think this is the perfect place and time to ask it. And I really hope you will do that. And um, and though I started my career, or I, I raced most of my life in small boats, kind of the biggest boat I did for a long time um, was a J-22. And we sailed that quite hard for a long time. Um, I've recently gotten into more big boat stuff. In fact, this past weekend, I did a race on a J121, which is a 40 foot, 40 foot new J boat um, from Fort Lauderdale to Palm Beach and back. Normally that's like a nine or 10 hour race and it took us 15 hours. So if you do the math, you can say, man, that was, that was like Hoover Lake in Ohio or Cave Run Lake in Kentucky kind of breeze. And we had a couple times where we had zeros on the wind velocity and we just were spinning. So I'm glad to frankly be back in my little boats after that. <laughs> but I learned a lot. But anyway, we're going to go through speed tonight. We're going to talk about trim, tuning, and balance. And again, whenever you have a question, we're, we're um, um, anxious to, to answer at any time. So again, we're going to kind of first start talking about it in a racing mode and, and how it all fits together. And, and obviously, as we know, at the start, we really have to have good speed. And when we talk about good speed at the start, it's not necessarily that we're trying to come off the line, you know, going 100 miles an hour relative to the boats around us, but it's more being able to go through the gears, <clears throat> excuse me, so we can accelerate with the boats that are close to us and be in that front row. And I think <clears throat> that is what's most important. If we can be in the first pack, the first row, so that we can hit the first shift, then we've been able to really have a successful start. You know, we can look at this picture of these thistles starting down here. This was at the midwinters a number of years ago. And you see that gray boat down there? And he looks great, right? He had a great start. He's punched out there nicely. but he's not in a position to be able to tack and take advantage of the shift like this blue boat right here in the foreground. And that's kind of part of starting is putting yourself in a spot where you can tack and maybe it is a little more conservative approach to the start. And the only way we can be conservative, which is I think important in whether it's one design racing or big boat racing or rating like PHRF racing, whatever it is, you know, if we can be conservative, we maybe won't gain as much at certain times, but we also won't lose as much at certain times. And I got to tell you, when we coached our college sailors, conservative was super important and boat speed was crucial in college sailing. And, you know, we would sail <clears throat> a three minute first weather leg sometimes, maybe a, a long one would be five minutes. <laughs> and if you think about it, there's no play in the shifts, even, even when it's shifty, like we're all used to sailing on, on the lake, you know, the shift you have at the start is probably the one you're gonna be living with that whole weather lake. So speed is important and it allowed you to punch out. And instead of try to be smart with the shifts, you were 
playing the fleet. You were being conservative and playing the, 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 the fleet. And we spent probably 75 to 80% of our time practicing boat speed. And, and I think that's really, really valuable. And I'll, I'll explain why I think it's important here in a second. But obviously making sure you're going as fast as you can gives you all kinds of opportunities at the start, you know, being conservative upwind and the whole bit. But it also makes a big difference with the team spirit. So anyway, this is so what I'm going to kind of speak on here just for a second is what a lot of people do to help build their speed skills is two boat testing. So these two boats right here in the front are fins and the boat on the right is going to the Olympics for our country whenever those games will be held, <laughs> hopefully in in Oshima next, um, next July is when they'll actually have them. But this was his tuning partner with him. Um, so Luke Muller is the guy going and Caleb Payne got the bronze medal in, um, in um, Brazil. And um, they spend an incredible amount of time two boat testing. There on the left are two J-22 speed testing. But I think this, this practicing with a teammate and we would do it with two or three boats with the college, really, really made a big difference. Not only did the boats get faster because you were focusing on boat speed, but frankly, it built a real team spirit. And I just took this document out of our, our college Bible, if you will, and I'm, we're not gonna go through any of this, but the first part is the only part I want you to take a look at is everyone must have the right attitude. Everyone gets faster and that's crucial. So for like our college sailors, when we'd have three people, three teams sailing alongside each other, the goal was not to try to beat the other person, but to learn how to make your boat go faster. And it was really important. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to make myself a little um, laser pointer here. So this is, these are the things that we live by. And, and it's interesting when we did this speed testing, our team got stronger as a result. So instead of the focus being on making your team or making yourself faster against your teammates, it was making the entire team perform and sail faster. And I, I say all this, I think for the kind of sailing that we all do, having some sort of a focus on speed testing is valuable. And um, this is how we set it up. These are two lightnings. Obviously a drone took this picture. And when you speed test, you set the boats up maybe two boat lengths apart. And the lured boat that we see here to the left is maybe just a little bit bow out. So they always have clear air. And then you sail and you sail and sail till you see who has an advantage. And, um, and if one boat has an advantage, you'd switch positions and sail, sail, sail some more. And, um, and then you talk about it. And then you'd watch what the boats are doing different and you'd learn from it. And I think even if we're not sailing exactly the same kind of boats, even if we're sailing very different boats, kind of focusing on speed when it really doesn't matter like in a race will really help us get faster. And when I say get faster again, help us change our gears. One of the parts that um, in this wordy document that I, I have up here that says that when somebody has a clear difference, they've been really fast, like the guy here to lured on the right clearly wiped out the guy on the left. And in fact, the guy on the right is the guy going to the Olympics for the U.S. here the next time. Once he gets there, nobody's learning anymore, so he should stop and reline. So if we're sailing two boats that are maybe a little bit different and maybe one boat will always have a little bit different speed. Maybe they're a little bit faster because they're a bigger boat or maybe a little more um, updated boat or whatever. You can still learn from that. And to go out with a buddy with the idea of how can we learn to make our boat go faster, I think will really help us. Um, day sailing and cruising will get to that more, but I think that having this, um, this focus really makes a difference.
you know, we go out and we practice starts sometimes. We go out and obviously we go out and practice our boat handling. And those two parts of the race are crucial, but we also have to have good speed to be able to get off and sail our nice conservative race. We are big on coaching. Obviously, I think coach is super important. And the advantage of, and, and when I use the term coach, obviously at the College of Charleston or with the Olympic program that I was with for a while, the coach was crucial to be able to help the different boats go faster. And they could talk about what they see as differences and, and make these changes and you'll be faster as a result. But even just somebody that's in a motorboat or another boat behind you can say, you know what? He's trimming his genoa a lot tighter than you are. And his mane is luffing less than yours or whatever it is. Having that set of eyes to help you see the difference will really help the boat, help the teams um, be a little quicker and a little more um, advanced as far as changing gears. So, and, and that's, you know, I just, I, even though I think at, you know, at a college level or an Olympic level or when professional sailors are, are tuning up like we see in J-70s and Melgus 24s and all that, I think in all the sailing that we do, it can really help us. And um, so I didn't mean to harp on that too much, but it's, I think it's really, uh, I've learned a lot watching that and guiding, you know, sailors, teams to, to work together like that. But when a coach is watching boats go upwind, the first thing that they look at is a balanced helm. And if we look at these two boats here and this boat, their tiller is right down the center, as we can see here with my, my fuzzy cursor. The wake is flat. And you can notice here he's sailing the boat perfectly flat. He maybe is even heeling to windward a little bit. The boat to leeward <clears throat> is healing. He's pulling hard on the tiller, so it's off center. And if you look at the water, there's a big gurgle behind it. And I'm gonna show you some more pictures of this because I think this is really important. And this is important whether we're racing or we're just cruising around because if we're just cruising around and we have a lot of weather helm, which is usually what we're fighting, where we're always pulling on the tiller to keep the boat going straight because the way the wind reacts on the sails and the balance of the boat makes it want to turn up into the wind. And if we can set the boat up so that it wants to track straight with very little helm, it's easier to steer. And frankly, it's a little safer too. You know, it's a little easier to keep the boat tracking. And if we have to bear away, if we're approaching another boat or a dock or whatever, if the helm isn't loaded up like we see here on the boat on the right, um, it will be, it'll be a lot easier. And of all the stuff we go through tonight, <clears throat> and as we go through, you know, the jib trim and the main trim and outhaul and Cunningham, all of those things reflect back on a balanced helm. And that is that the tiller is right down the center. Okay. And, and I say tiller down the center. So, what it means is there's very little tug on the tiller. Yeah, yeah Greg, I think people would like you to expand a little bit on that. Um, uh, on how to steer the boat using the sails a little bit more. Okay, okay. So <clears throat> when, uh, and we're gonna go through some of the details about like what the Cunningham does and Mass Bend does to flat. Actually, let me go to this next one, this might help. So this is an IC37, which is a new um, one design offshore boat. Um, and I, this past year, um, Unfortunately, we didn't get to do it a lot because of the pandemic, but I was hired as their class coach, which meant that I would coach all the boats that were racing. And, um, and we had 15 at race week and 15 at their nationals. And it was really fun because even though this is a, obviously a, quite a high tech big boat, it, what it came down to is the boats being balanced upwind. So here's a perfect example tiller is right down the center and we can see the wake is flat this is a really speedy boat so it actually has a wake that's pretty cool and showing it's going fast but what we found was and and I, I hope I can explain this well without getting too technical what we found the more tuning and two boat testing we did in 
testing and the speed was that a fuller jib, and you can see here when you look at this jib, you can see my cursor over here, the jib is pretty darn full. If we are looking at an airfoil shape, you know, a wing shape in this jib, it's a very deep jib, flaps are on, right? Like an airplane wing, it's very deep. And the main, on the other hand, is pretty flat. And if you think about it, a fuller jib is going to want to pull the bow down, right? You want to pull it away from the wind, and the main will want to make turn the boat up into the wind. So if we can make the main a little flatter and the jib a little fuller, like we see here, the boat will want to track with less tug on the tiller. In a, in a cruising situation, we might simply just ease the main sheet out a little bit, keep the jib trimmed, and the boat will balance quite nicely. And again, when I say balance, there will be like no tug on the wheel, no tug on the tiller, the boat will wanna sail straight. So the tighter the jib, or in a racing sense, the fuller the jib, the more the bow will wanna pull down. And flip side, the flatter the main, the more ease the main, we'll talk about the Traveler obviously, or the Vang in the case of a Flying Scott, um, that will help reduce the pressure on the boat to turn up into the wind, which will create weather helm. And again, in a cruising situation, we might not have to worry about the actual shape of the sails, but easing the main, trimming the jib, or vice versa will help balance the boat, and it'll actually steer by using the sails. And it'll be much easier to steer the boat, hang on to it, and again, be a lot less... Um, It'll be just safer because as we approach something, it'll be much easier to bear off. T if I could, I'm sorry to belabor this, but taking this to the next step, when we're racing and a starboard tack boat is crossing us and we're ducking that boat, you know, let's say we got to do like we, like we're supposed to, you know, <laughs> keeping the jib in tight and letting the main out, looking at this IC37 picture would allow the sails to make the boat bear off so we don't have to use a whole lot of rudder. The boat will almost turn itself. And then as we go behind the boat, we could almost ease the jib and trim the main end to help turn the boat back up. And the same thing would apply if we were day sailing and we wanted to luff up to a dock, let's say, or luff up to our mooring, we could, as we approach it, let the jib luff, trim the main in, and that'll make the boat turn up. And we can guide how quickly we want to turn it up by how much we trim the main in. So steering with the sails actually is a lot easier and a lot safer. Greg, okay? I got one more thing. Yeah. So um, your microphone is positioned so that it's catching your zipper. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. That's all right. How's that? Is that better? Probably way better. Yeah. Yeah. Thank I'm you. sorry. So that was all. No, scratchy. don't be sorry. It's okay. That's could you guys? Problem. Did you, Did everybody catch that? Okay. Was I that... think so. Yeah. I think it just. Yeah. It. You know. It's one of those things where it, it'll be better. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Well, and I and it, we have more questions or more more we can discuss on that if people do. Um, I know you guys. I understand are using Sunfish for your juniors, which is a great boat, um, and. This, these are a couple shots that I wanted to put in here for that gang, but also again to show you a balanced helm. And this is kind of cool. This is the last person I hired before I left the College of Charleston, um, our assistant coach, a guy named Connor Bluen, and he went to the Pan Am Games in Peru a year ago, and I was fortunate enough to go down and coach him. And, um, and he did really well. He just missed getting the bronze medal. He's not a big guy and it was blowing real hard. But it was interesting. This was right before the Sunfish North Americans in Charleston, which he won. And um, I realized watching this, how tricky this little boat is. First, the balanced helm is crucial. You can see how Connor's hiking like crazy on this shot. Here on the right, tiller's right down the center. Look how flat the wake is. The boat's perfectly balanced. And he's got a little bit of heel, okay? So it's not just based on how flat the boat is. If we have anybody out here that's in, in the crowd that sails a sea scow, you know in a sea boat that you have to sail heeled all the time and you adjust the travelers and the main to balance the helm. Same deal. 
Same thing here. There, he's sailing with a little bit of heel, but the travel or the tillers right down the center showing a balanced helm. On the picture on the left, and sorry, it's a little bit fuzzy. This tack, he's sailing with a little bit too much heel. Maybe the mains trimmed in a little bit too tight. He clearly has helm, and you can see the gurgle of the rudder dragging through the water here at the back of the boat. But I wanted to put this in too to show you how important it is on starboard tack where the sail is on the other side of the mast, you know, or on the, when the sail is on starboard, it's much deeper. You can see it's a fat sail here with a tight leech. And on this side, it's a flatter sail with a more open leech, straighter leech. So you have to trim harder on starboard to make the boat point higher. It's a tricky little boat. And then you have to be mindful of the balance. So anyway, I didn't mean to get, I, it, I really enjoyed watching, though we think of the sunfish as a very basic, easy to sail boat. It's a cool boat because it teaches us a lot, especially about balance. So let's talk now about main trim, because as we said earlier, this has a huge effect on the balance of the boat. Basic rule of thumb 101, the upper batten would be parallel to the boom. So we got this red stripe at the top batten, which is a straight line between the outboard end of the batten, the inboard end of the batten. And we're going to trim the main sheet so that it's basically parallel to the boom. We are eyeballing this under the boom, looking up at the top batten. Um, just, I guess, for grins here, I wouldn't say this is the guide or this isn't what we'd check if it was, say, blowing 20. You know, we aren't going to climb in in our sea scow or our flank scot and eyeball underneath there. But it's going to give us a, a rule of thumb, a guide. And what I would hope is we would look at this upper batten parallel of the boom, sit back up on the high side where we normally steer from and kind of memorize what that shape looks like to us. So then we'll know that we're in a good place. OK, so that's, say, 70 percent of our sailing will be with that upper batten parallel to the boom. When we're trying to accelerate, let's say first gear, second gear, when we're trying to accelerate off the starting line, let's say we got a huge header, you know, where the breeze has gone forward and the sails left and we got to get the boat going again, or somebody tacked on top of us, or we hit a big motorboat wake and we've got to get the boat moving again, we're going to ease the main sheet out and allow the boat to develop speed and accelerate. So we're going to ease the main sheet out. So this top batten now is angled outboard from parallel to boom. And this is going to be important whether we're, they say, on cruising or flat out racing. It's going to really help a lot to, to be mindful of these gears. Now, we're going to compromise speed and pointing when we do this, but it will still give us that opportunity to really accelerate. And then fifth gear, if you, if you could put it that way, when we need to point, you know, if we're in flat water, we really need to trim hard to make the boat point. We'll trim the main harder. And now you can see we've really hooked that top batten in re relation to the boom. And we aren't going to do that for very long. It might only be for, you know, 10 seconds, 15 seconds or whatever. But that's going to allow the boat to go into a higher gear until it starts to lose speed, die a little bit. Then we ease it back down to first gear, get it to accelerate. So the point is we're never stuck in a gear for very long. People talk about playing the main sheet a lot, in and out, in and out, and all they're doing is going through the gears. Did I explain that well? Is that, is that okay? So this is a picture. Any, any questions, Chris? Is that? No, I think you're okay. Okay, good. I, I, I got it. <clears throat> okay, good. <laughs> So this is a picture of a J-121 main. In fact, this is a boat I sailed on this past weekend. It's an unusual shot because there's wind in the sails. <laughs> but it has a full top batten. And I know a lot of the sails out there these days, especially on cruising boats, um, racing big boats, have a full top batten. And what we say here is the last third of the batten, okay, on that top full batten is parallel to the boom. OK, and we can see here on this big boat, on this big main, the telltale is flowing. And I'm going to talk about that here in a second. That's not necessarily the perfect guide, but it can tell us if we're way over trimmed for a long period of time. So anyway, 
this gives us the, the gears. I guess I wanna go back to something I said earlier. The most important thing to tell us we're kind of in the right gear is the feel on the tiller. If we have the main trimmed end to point and the boat's healed a little bit too much and it's stalling and the upper leech is hooked, the boat will die because we're fighting the weather helm. So even though we're in a point gear or we're in a, an acceleration gear in gear one, we want to make sure that the helm is balanced. So this is a real pretty shot of a J22 main. And I put this big blue arrow up here to point out, as you can see here behind the tell behind the batten at the leech, the telltale is stalled here. It's not flowing like this one. And when the telltale is flowing off the batten, that usually indicates we're in first gear. We're trying to accelerate. And in a boat that we're really racing hard and trying to go as high as we can, like I said, probably 20% of the time that telltale will be stalled like this. And um, maybe 50% of the time it will be flowing, okay? That leaves some of the other time where it's back and forth all the time. So, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question. So I have, uh, so as I told you before, I have a Flying Scott uh -huh. and I have one main telltale and that's on my top batten. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is I'm not shooting for that to be flowing all the time. I'm only going to have that flowing sort of coming off the starting line or in, in places where I'm trying to gain speed power up when I'm sort of in, in, you know, moving along the, uh, you know, balancing, pointing and, and speed, yeah. it's going to hook behind. Exactly. Exactly. Wow. Okay. Chris. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I understand a lot of us sail boats similar to a, a Catalina 22. Um, and, and, you know, a lot of ways it is going to act a lot like a J 22 where it's similar in that. And, Different boats are going to be in different places gear wise, you know, where, um, you know, a Flying Scott might be in first gear a little bit more of the time because it's just a heavier boat. Maybe a Catalina 22 would be like that. But you hit it right on the head, Chris, when we're at speed, you know, I guess in big boats, they call it VMG, velocity made good, which is the fastest speed versus your height. Um, that telltale will be stalled. But you're, I think your point also is that you're like you said it, which was perfect, you're adjusting that all the time. You'll be out to first gear so the telltale's flowing. You'll be trimmed in hard so it'll be stalled and all the time you're feeling that balanced helm. So that, and, that is perfect. That's exactly what you'd wanna aim for. So let me, let me do a follow-up so I can see the second telltale down there. I only have one on my Scott main, mm -hmm. it's the top batten one. Do you think, it's e so should lower telltales then stream and is that a good way to sort of gauge where your main is too or you know, is I, that that's a good question i think the bigger the boat and the farther the spread on the battens like on that big boat main i had a picture of a second ago that would help a j22 is marginal whether that would be helpful because lots of times the second telltale down would be stalled as well so on our, back in the days when we made Flying Scots mains and, or thistles or lightnings, we only had one telltale on that top batten for exactly what you're talking about, Chris, yeah. So ho hopefully this, and I think, again, these guys are gonna be helpful whether you're racing one designs or you're even day sailing in your boat because it's gonna allow you to get top speed and be balanced and make it easier to steer the boat. So sometimes so, though, the telltale should be flowing all the time. <laughs> another question. Oh, that's an interesting picture. Uh, <laughs> another question has come up and I think you're gonna do it, but um, uh, it, John Anthony's asked, can you discuss Cunningham usage and playing it regarding main trim, especially through waves? Oh yeah, I'll, can I, um, we're gonna get to Cunningham. And if I don't answer that well, Chris, will you say, hey, you know, Elaborate on that a little more. Okay, okay, I'll try. Yeah, John, yeah. jump back in if he doesn't get to it. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, no problem. No problem. So anyway, just a funny picture of a shields on the bottom in windy conditions in uh, Dallas, Texas. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about mass bend. And on some boats, mass bend is a 
bigger um, or a more elaborate concern or makes a bigger difference than on others. And um, this is a Buccaneer class boat. Um, and it's sailing with a lot of mass bend here, obviously. Interestingly enough, this boat doesn't have a backstay or anything like that. It's being accomplished. The mass bend is being accomplished with main sheet tension and boom vane. But I wanted to put this in here because I wanted to kind of describe a little bit, get a little bit technical about how a sail is designed so that that will lead us to some of the next guides we'll talk about and how we know when we're bending our mass to the right amount. And this would even apply to a Flying Scott. Um, I know on Catalina 22s, you guys have both forward and aft lower shrouds. I think this will help with that. Um, and some boats, it's a guide that works better than others. But when a sail maker designs a sail, they have to make the sail match this kind of mass bend that's gonna develop in heavy air. And if we just took a flat sheet and put it on a bendy mass like this, the sail would distort because we're trying to bend or stretch a hunk of fabric that's being attached to a bendy pole like this. So what we do is we actually put cloth, if you laid the sail on the floor and you look at the front of it at the left, there would be curve in the front of it. Interestingly enough, it's called luff curve. <laughs> And that luff curve is cut in there to match the amount of mass bend we're gonna get in heavy air. Now, the tricky part is if we get in light winds and we aren't able to bend the mass very much, then that luff curve ends up in the sail and makes the sail really big and baggy and too powerful and we can't balance the boat. So we gotta have some guides to know how to get the mass bend right. Um, and let me see if I can go through that here. L let me show this to you a little bit better, maybe a little bit easier. This is a TP-52, which is a big high performance, one design big boat. And if we look at the sail here, we see there's a lot of fullness in the front. It's very full, very powerful. We see bubble here in the main. And lots of times we could say, oh, that is um, backwind from the jib. And it could be, but generally what happens on boats like this is indication that the mast is too stiff. So if we look at that same sail, and now we're gonna make the mast bendier, we're gonna adjust the rig, look how much prettier it looks. And the front of the sail here, the luff area is much flatter. And if you look at this, these two full top battens up at the top, look at the difference from there to there. And all it is is the mast is bent more, and we've pulled the left curve out of the sail and it's, it's flatter. And on this boat, they have a backstay, they have a mast ram, they have all kinds of hydraulics. On a boat like the Flying Scott, all we have is a boom vane. Or on a Lightning, all we have is a backstay. But it still accomplishes the same thing as to pull this, to bend the mast like we need it to flatten the sail out. And I don't mean to get too technical here, but but it's helpful to kind of have an idea to get back to the balance. And I just want to show this to you. So even in little dinky boats like we race in college, we need some neat guide to tell us that we've reached that maximum bend or the ideal mass bend. And remember I said that if we bend the mast and have a hunk of flat cloth on there, we get big nasty wrinkles will distort the sail. Well, we want to know when we've reached that maximum bend and we look at this FJ sail here and we see wrinkles at this point. And this might be telling us, okay, we've overdone it. We've got too much mass bend right here. And this sail is a little bit prettier and we have just a little bit down low. So my point is a little bit of wrinkle. And we'll, as we go through guides for all the sails, we're going to see wrinkles are really a telltale sign of tuning and trim, whether it's mass bend, Cunningham, whatever. So it's a really good guide. A little bit of wrinkle like that is good. Here's a few of those IC37 sailing upwind. And if you look, it's kind of like the mama bear, papa bear, baby bear on the mass bend department. Look at this guy here. These are exactly the same mass, exactly the same sails, and they're tuned the same way. 
except this guy here has more back stay on and he's bending the mass more. So you can see over here, the boat on the right has huge overbend wrinkles, too many. And this guy has maybe not quite as much, but still quite a few wrinkles. So he's got his mass bent a lot, but it's a lot closer. And this guy has just a hint, hint of them and he's perfect. So it gives you an idea that when it comes to tuning, these boats, you know, it doesn't take much to make a mass bend a little more or a little less. And what we'd see as far as balance, going back to that first picture, whether we're trimming the main in and out or here we're flattening the main, this boat might not point as high. The boat on the right might not point as high because the main is flatter and it won't want to turn the boat up into the wind. So the balance will be out of phase. Okay, does that make sense? Hope that hope that helps. So on any like like Chris on the Flying Scott, when we're in breeze and we're overpowered and we're putting the vang on and we're hiking out, you know, and we're trying to keep the boat flat, we got the vang on and we're easing the main sheet out, we will see wrinkles like this, like this, certainly not like this, but we will see the start of these wrinkles telling us that we've got enough vang on, you know on a thistle. Well, let me say, I got a picture of a thistle coming up. Same deal on, um, on a Catalina 22 where the mass is stiffer. It's harder to get to that point for sure, but maybe when it's blowing real, real hard, we might see a faint bit of wrinkle here like this, but I, and I'm going to, I'll beat this into the ground a little bit more. <laughs> so here's a small boat, another picture of an FJ, and we see these wrinkles down here which is exactly what we wanna see. The Cunningham's on, so the top of the main is smooth, but these are overbend wrinkles telling us that the mast is set up just right. And just taking it to the point where it works on big boats too. Here's a J70, and we see the overbend wrinkles down low. And this is a good guide. This is telling us that we're, we've reached that mast bend that tells us we're just right with the sail. So as a, as a guide, we wanna see just a hint of these wrinkles, like we talked about here, here, and here, okay? Just telling us that we're just about there. But if we get too far, like with this thistle, and again, I apologize, the picture is so fuzzy. He has overbend wrinkles all the way back, and the whole sail is what we like to say in sail making terms is washed out. He's got too much mass bend, and you can see how bent the mast is here, and he's just completely distorted the sail. So those wrinkles would tell him he's overdone it. Okay. And back to these IC37s. This gives you an idea of kind of what happens with the mains. This boat on the right, you can see the overbend wrinkles here, okay, all the way up and down the left. So they have quite a bit of mass bend. And same design sails, same boat, same mast, but just trimmed differently. Look at the back wind here in this main. And you can see how fat this main is, how full this main is. And this boat on the left would probably want to point higher because the main is fuller and more powerful, while the boat on the right would really be, I guess we'd like to say, more easily driven it would be easier to make track. And if they wanted to point, they'd simply trim the main end tighter and they'd probably carry the speed and point higher. This boat would struggle to go forward because the main is so deep. And I, you know, I'm, I'm guessing here, but I'm, I'm hoping if we were behind it, we would see that he would have quite a bit of helm and they'd be pulling hard on the tiller to keep it going straight. Greg, another question. So when do the wrinkles need a Cunningham to remove them? This is a, a, a Catalina 22 sailor. Ah, good, good question. So um, let me see if I, so let me back up here a little bit. On this J70 here, you can see here, he has a fair bit of Cunningham on, right? And it's probably blowing maybe 10 to 12. He's got his Cunningham on. So the luff is smooth from basically the spreader window. And what I like to say is a quarter of the way up, the luff is smooth. 
Okay, so he's got Cunningham on here. And these are wrinkles that are totally induced by overbend wrinkles. You know, I mean, by the mass bend developing the overbend. And the point is well made that you could pull so hard on the Cunningham that we would pull those wrinkles out. And if we did that, we would see the draft or the deepest part of the sail go right up behind the mast and the sail would be quite slow. So again, going back to this, we want to try to sail with the left being smooth to maybe a quarter of the way down. And that's going to be a good guide in, in every condition. The only exception might be if it's um, survival conditions, let's say 20 plus, you know, where we'd go pretty hard on the Cunningham. And I've got more slides coming on that, Chris. Hopefully I'll answer that better. But that's a really good point. And you need to fight that urge to remove the overbend wrinkles with the Cunningham because we'll, we'll change the shape of the sail and, um, and the balance of the boat. And I think I'll be able to show that here in a second. Like this boat here, he has obviously not enough Cunningham on. If he pulled the Cunningham so the wrinkles were minimized down to here, he'd still have huge overbend wrinkles, but it wouldn't look near as bad. But I mean, the, his wrinkles would still be back in this area here. But part of his problem why he's obviously going to be pretty slow here is he doesn't have enough Cunningham on either. And this boat, though, on the other hand, you can see they have Cunningham on. And actually, they both have a similar Cunningham on. So these are truly overbend wrinkles. OK. And <clears throat> One last shot here I'm going to show. This is kind of a perfect picture showing two J22s with a kind of a combination and of Cunningham and Mass Bend just right. So the boat to windward, 1586, has just the right amount of Mass Bend. We see the overbend wrinkles, OK? There we go. And we're right just about maybe a third of the way up. Maybe they could have a little bit more Cunningham on, so it'd be just at the spreader window, but the top of the main is smooth, okay? This J22 has almost exactly the same amount of Cunningham on. We can see wrinkles along the left up to here, but they don't have enough mass bend, and they need to pull. Actually, if you look here, for, I think Catalina 22s are rigged similar to J22s where there's a bridle back here, so the bridle on this boat has the back stay down here and their bridle is way up here. So they're just in a different gear to weather and they've got the mass bend set up just right. Is that okay? Any questions on that? Is this, is this too um, basic or too technical, you guys? Is this, is this okay? What do you think? I don't know. I, it's great for me, but... What do you, anybody want to jump in? It's just too basic, too technical. I, I do have one question that I kind of missed that I was going to circle back to, but I'll throw it out now. So, yeah. um, uh, so one of the people uh, asked about general guidance on where place, where telltales should be placed and what they should look like in different gears. Ah, okay. That's a good question. I'm going to get into the jib and um, it's, it will be really, I think the telltales will really help a lot there. That'll make a big difference. So a um, couple, of, couple of comments have come in answering your, so um, uh, very, basically some people are like, wow, this is a little bit drinking from the fire hose, but keep going. And others are <laughs> like, wow, this is perfect. Okay. And so I think you're kind of hitting the middle of the group. It's a, it's a very diverse group, so. Okay. Well, this is a good time to say, Chris, and I meant to say this early on. Um, I'm going to have, I had my phone number and email at the beginning, you guys, and I'll have it at the end again. And, and I told Chris, and I'm really sincere about this, if there's something I didn't explain well or you have more questions about it, please don't hesitate to email me, call me, whatever. I'm happy to help. Obviously, I love talking about this stuff. And, you know, if it gets to be midnight and you guys want to jump off, feel free, okay? <laughs> Just kidding. I promise we won't. Um, so um, we had a question about the Cunningham, and it is an important adjustment. 
And I will say, I think it's a way underutilized adjustment, especially in, in smaller boats, but in a lot of the boats we sail, it really makes a huge difference. And um, let's first start with the basics, what the Cunningham does. And this is maybe a little bit technical, but I hope we just kind of ignore the little arrows and the, the depth arrow and all that. And I'll just kind of look at the shape of the sail. So in this picture, this J24 main, it's probably blowing five to eight, let's say. And the Cunningham is loose. Probably not a bad position for light air like that. And we have wrinkles going up high, like we said, we rarely want to do unless it's light air. So now, so the Cunningham's loose here. There's the wrinkles. Ooh, check this out. What do you think that is right there? That would be one of those nasty looking overbend wrinkles. So on this J24, even though it's light five to eight, they've tuned the boat to have a little bit of that overbend wrinkle down low here that we see. But we're talking about the Cunningham now. So the left is eased. Now we put the Cunningham on and make it basically smooth. And look at this airfoil shape here. We'll go back again so you can take a look. This arrow is indicative of where the deepest part is the most round is the curvature, max curvature in the wing, if you will. And this part is flatter. All these little arrows are meaning to point here and just say this is flatter, but compare it to this one where this is rounder back here, but the maximum curvature is back farther. So if the Cunningham is too loose, like we talked early on in the deepest part of the wing of the sail moves back, it's going to increase the helm or the desire of the boat to turn up into the wind. So this actually relates to everybody, whether we're sailing a Flying Scott, a J24, a J22, a J121, or just our cruising boat. If we have the luff really loose on the main when there's much wind, the leech will get really tight and hooked and we'll have a lot of weather helm. So taking this one step further, if we, this goes on to, um, here's a shot showing the extremes, if you will. If you think about it in a boat, like a lightning, let's say here, where we have an adjustable backstay and we pull the backstay on so the mast bends, okay? And that means the top is getting closer to the bottom because we're bending the mast and flattening the sail out. And here are those overbend wrinkles that we're talking about. But as the two ends get closer to one another, the luff will get looser. So automatically we should pull on Cunningham just to maintain, maintain the same shape. So as the mass bends, Chris, when you put the vang on hard on your flying Scott, or if we're in a sunfish and it's windy and the, and the gaff or the sprit or whatever it's called is bending, then we should lash it a little tighter so we don't have those wrinkles. And that will keep the sail shape with the draft in the right position. Like on this lightning here, he's, it's blowing enough that all three people are on the high side. He's got wrinkles all the way up to the north, up to the, um, the numbers. And, um, but he's got the overbend wrinkles. If he pulled the Cunningham down to like we see here, just below the spreader window, that lower quarter, like we were talking, he would be much faster and the boat would balance better. When I say much faster, the boat would balance better. Now, let me say this too. Both these guys happen to be two-time North American champions. <laughs> so they're not, shall we say, hackers. But I think what I wanted to point out is here how important it is to keep on top of the gears. And even, you know, the sailors that do it all the time get behind on the gears. So keeping on that Cunningham is really important. And like I said before, it's an underutilized adjustment. And some boats... You can do it purely with the halyard tension at the top, which is fine. But what we're really just talking about is the luff tension on the main. But it is important because sailcloth will stretch. And to keep that stretch from letting the sail shape move to our, too far back, we got to keep that luff smooth when the breeze is on. OK, any questions on that? Hey, Greg, I don't know if you can hear me. It's John Anthony. I've got a question for you. Oh, yeah, you. John. Yeah. How, do, how do you know, how do people play this? We got walked pretty bad on a, in a multi-haul race with a four-seared dash 750 and an F27 who's 
sailed by a very, very good, experienced uh, multi-hull racer from Royal 500,000s on up. Um, and he said he was playing that Cunningham the whole time while he passed us. And I don't quite understand how he did that. It was in the Chesapeake Bay, and it was probably blowing 10 to 13 that day, uh, mm -hmm. just below Whitecap range. So I, I don't quite understand how you play that or how you assign a crew to play that Cunningham, then make those adjustments as you go on. Well, that's a good question, John. I, I think, um, let me see if on this next picture I can show, oh, it doesn't show it, but um, we, when we sailed a J-22 a lot and when the boat came stock from the factory, not to tell a story here, but I just wanna make a point how important it is to adjust the Cunningham when we are going through the gears, they just had a cleat on the side of the mast. So to get, if you're on port tack and the cleat was on starboard, the forward crew would have to lean in off the deck, lean behind the mast and adjust the Cunningham. Well, obviously what would happen is we wouldn't adjust the Cunningham much. When I put a swivel cleat on with a long enough line that my wife could stay on the high side and hike and play the Cunningham, we absolutely got faster, no question about it. And my point is, in boats that have bendier mass, like I bet these, these catamaran trimarans you're talking about, or even a lightning or um, a flying Scott, when you're going to trim the, the vang on hard, when the mass bends, ideally, the Cunningham should follow right behind. And when we hit waves and we ease the main sheet out and we ease the vang off, or in the case of a lightning, we ease the backstay off, immediately, the Cunningham should be eased to follow. So it is one of those adjustments like in, in our boats where I would have my wife be eyeballing that all the time. Or in the case of a lightning, the controls are right here and it's right beside me. So it's not even distracting. Like if I trim the main end hard, the mass bends, I glance up, I get a bunch of nasty wrinkles like this up high. I just reach down and put some Cunningham on. So I think it's one of those deals, if it just becomes an automatic adjustment, it, it will help the boat change gears smoother and balance a lot better. But one thing that's different too, John, on those, those bigger boats, the trimarans, catamarans that are really hard performance, is the Cunningham actually goes a long way in bending their mast. Um, that guy I showed you, Connor Blue on Sail on the Sunfish, is also a wasp national champion, which is one of the foiling, um, like a moth, but a, a one design wasp. And they bend the mast with the Cunningham. When they pull real hard on the left of the sail, it actually bends the mast and flattens the sail out. So for those guys, John, not only are they keeping the shape of the sail in the right place, but they're also probably altering the bend in the mast too at the same time. So, um, and I, I don't mean to add another adjustment that we have to pay attention to that's going to be distracting. But the point I tried to make earlier is that it's, it, it could be just plain old automatic, you know, like when we pull the backstay on or when we trim the main sheet in tighter, we look up at the sail, we see those wrinkles, we just automatically go to the Cunningham, you know, and it just becomes one more adjustment that we make. It's almost like in a puff easing the main out, you know, it's in a puff, we'd also pull the Cunningham on, you know? Did, that, did I answer that okay? I don't mean to make it a project, but it's funny in college sailing when we do our two boat testing and in those boats, the Cunningham is on the side of the mast, but it is imperative that the crew reaches in there and adjusts that in a puff. And it is a real a, a technique to master to be able to stay as far out as you can and get that, but it makes such a difference in all these boats. You did answer that. I was on mute. I, I tried to respond. But we're putting, at times, we're putting, yeah, there's no backstay on these trimarans like the Corsairs, the Dash 750s, and the F 27s, the F 28s. So we're actually, at times, we're leading the main sheet to winch to impart more main bend, especially when, when it starts to, to honk on us and then ease in when we need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it, it's so important. And again, that makes such a big difference and going from a straight mast to a bent mast on a rig like that with all the roach on the sails too and all yeah. that. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So let's talk Cunningham here, or I'm sorry, outhaul, outhaul tension. 
see, I got out Cunningham on the mind. It's, it is an important adjustment. Where the outhaul, on the other hand, is not an important adjustment. And I think um, I just wanted to put these two pictures in here to give us some kind of an idea on how to have a guide on measure where the cunning, where the outhaul is um, and how to adjust it. Um, and most tuning guides that sailmakers put together say, in the case of this J22 that we're looking at here, we would say, pull your outhaul tight enough that the shelf seam, which is the seam along the bottom of the sail, and many boats have shelf foots like this, shelf feet, I guess you'd say. Um, we would say, pull the outhaul tight enough that the seam would be an inch and a half off the side of the boom. Hmm. And frankly, once it's there, unless there's a huge change in conditions, we'd never adjust it. I mean, we wouldn't adjust it upwind if we hit a wave. We wouldn't adjust it downwind when we round the weather mark because it's just not very important. Um, it's it's going to change the fullness in the bottom of the main, but we already said we want to make sure we get the sail flat enough down there with those overbend wrinkles. So I just wanted to show you a really good guide. The problem with doing it at the back, you know, at the clue is it's hard to see it. And frankly, sometimes the band back there is not exactly the right place where this is really telling us the depth of the sail. And it's not very um, technical, I guess you'd say. We would look at that and measure, kind of eyeball where that seam is off the side of the boom to be an inch and a half. On the college boats, this is really technical. We'd put our fist up sideways if it was light to medium air, and then we'd turn it that way so it's vertical if it was heavier <laughs> between the skirt and the bottom. And this means on a loose footed main. So this is what we're talking about here is a distance from the skirt to the side of the boom. Okay, does that make sense? One thing that is important though is not to get the outhaul too loose. Our intuition says in light air or when we're trying to accelerate, make the main big and fat and baggy and powerful. But the problem with that is the wind has to bend around that big fat shape. You know, if we're looking at this, the wind has to bend around this, this depth and it'll stall or we'll get backwind between the main and the jib like we saw in some of those earlier pictures. This, frankly, is eased out just for the effect for the picture. And in any breeze, this seam would be right up against the side of the boom or the skirt would be right up against the side of the boom. And even, even in a big boat like this, this is that J121 that I was telling you about, we rarely adjusted the outhaul, just not that important. Cunningham on the other on the other hand is. This is a J70 in light air. And what I wanted to show you here is why we look at the outhaul to be tensioned where it is. And when a sailmaker or a coach is looking at the back of a main, they're looking at this part of the main coming down nice and smooth and fair right to the boom. And if we have the outhaul too tight, often we'd see like a hollow spot right here at the window we can almost see a little bit of one starting to develop here, but too tight and we'll, we'll get a reverse curve here. We'll distort the bottom of the main too loose and the sail will be big and baggy here. And obviously, like we said, big and baggy will make the boat stall and it'll close a slot between the main and the jib. Okay. Very important, but not, not important to adjust all the time, just important not to have too full and too eased. Now let's talk about the traveler. And I know this is, oh, wait, I missed something here. I wanted to point out the introduction to the traveler in light air on this J70 we see here. And I know you guys know all this that have travelers, but I just want to emphasize it. The traveler is all the way to windward so that the main sheet can set the top batten parallel to the boom or to whatever gear we want to be in just right. And the boom is close to center line. Because if we left the traveler in the center, then the boom would be off center, maybe two feet, three feet, and the boat won't point. So by pulling the traveler to windward and adjusting the main sheet, we'll put the boom close to center. So it's two separate things. I guess first, maybe to, to simplify that, we'd look at the main and we'd say, perfect, upper batten parallel of the boom, 
telltale stalled, what do we say, 70% of the time. Now we'll eyeball where that boom is on center line, and that would tell us how far to pull the traveler to windward. Okay. And again, putting that traveler on, or the boom end, I should say, I'm sorry, boom on center line is what we're looking for. And that works in just about every single boat, except maybe a sea scow. <laughs> Um, but it's funny on those IC 37s, they will actually pull the traveler to windward enough that the boom is above center line. Very unusual, but it's also very fast. So anyway, that's light to light medium air on boats with travelers. And then in heavy air, when the boat's overpowered, the traveler becomes, we think of it as a way to depower the boat, but I'd rather say it's, it's a way to balance the boat. So the, on this lightning here, the main is flat, okay? It's heavy, heavy air here. We can see the outhaul is real tight. It's heavy, heavy air. The boat is flat. She has let the traveler down. So the boom is 18 inches, 24 inches, as we can see here below center line. And all that's doing is balancing the helm, okay? The main is still gonna look the way she wants it to. Backstay will be on, Cunningham will be tight. She'll have the overbend wrinkles in this area right here. You can kind of see that it's flatter there, but the traveler being eased to lure will balance the helm. And that's real important. Um, and then it's also important when, when it lightens up to pull the traveler back up to get the helm balanced. Otherwise we'll get like almost a lured helm, which means the boat will want to bear off and we won't be able to point as high. So, I'd kind of look at the traveler position as our rough balance or our rough adjustment and the main sheet as our fine tune. So what I guess I'm getting at there is I don't think it's something that you would be playing the traveler up and down, up and down. It's maybe in a puff, we'd let the traveler down a foot and then fine tune it with the main sheet. And then when it lightens up, we'd pull the traveler back up close to center and again, fine tune it with the main sheet because the main sheet is truly our throttle. And this is a 470 going upwind on a lot of breeze. And um, clearly there's a lot of Cunningham on here. Clearly the outhaul is tight. There's the overbend wrinkles we're talking about. And it's windy, so he's got quite a bit of overbend wrinkles. But I wanted to point this out because this is going to relate more to Chris and the Flying Scott. On this 470, they don't have a traveler. They have a traveler bar, but they don't use it as a traveler. They have so much boom vang on right here that the boom is literally going in and out sideways like a bar barn door. And the boom vang is what's bending the mast. So we can see here, the, the boom is way off center line, what, maybe three feet? And the vang on is so hard, we actually see some bend in the boom that that's creating mass bend. And he is balancing the helm with the main sheet. And on a lot of boats like van, like Thistles, Flying Scots, 470s, even J22s, the Vang becomes a very important tool. And I bet it would on a, uh, a Catalina 22, it would be a valuable tool. And, and the other thing, you all, when, it's, when we're in shifty, puffy conditions, being able to adjust the traveler quick enough to keep the helm balanced is, is maybe not only tough or tricky, but I think it's unrealistic where if we can play the main in and out quickly and we have the boom vang on kind of hard like this 470 does, then when we play the main in and out, the boom will go just sideways back and forth, much like it would if it was on a track, if we were playing the traveler. Yet we can do it so quickly with the main sheet. I hope that makes sense because I think that makes a big difference and a lot of boats utilize that that vang upwind, even if they have a backstay. Any questions, Chris, anybody? Does that make sense? No, none recently. Okay, good. So now let's talk jib. And, uh, and we're just gonna go through the jib here, you guys. I'd say we're, just so you get an idea where we are, we're probably two thirds of the way through it all. And um, this is a shot of a good friend of mine named Mike Ingham, who um, got second in the J24 Worlds. He's won the J24 North Americans. 
let's go over a couple things here. We can see the outhaul. Remember I talked about the shape of the main being nice and smooth all the way down to the boom. So his outhaul is set for that. His traveler we can see here is to windward. Even though it's decent breeze and they're all on the high side, travelers to windward. The boom is on the center. His helm is right down the center. So the wake is pretty darn flat. Um, the main, I don't know if you can see it. I can see it, or maybe I, I want to see it. <laughs> the top telltale is stalled, okay? So he's got the main trimmed hard enough. But this is the lead in for jib trim. And what the ultimate goal in setting our jib is, is to make the back of the jib, the exit of the jib, the leech of the jib, match the entry of the main. And that is be symmetrical to it. And if we look at this, it's really hard to make it much better. It's just absolutely perfectly set. And you can get that through the jib lead position, through the jib sheet position, through the jib halyard tension, which when I refer to that, I'm talking about the cloth tension, which is like the Cunningham on the main. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about luff sag, which is like mass bend to the main. And we'll talk to that, but let's go first to- I got a base. couple questions for you, Greg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So first one is how about when we want twist versus when we don't and how to apply it? I think it's a uh, twist in the main. Uh, okay. So twist, um, that's a good question. And different boats really like to have a lot of twist. Th that IC37 that I showed you likes to sail with twist in the main. And when we talk about twist, we're talking about um, the upper batten being angled outboard from parallel to the boom. The more that upper batten is angled outboard, the more twisted the sail is. When we trim the main end tighter and that top batten comes in and is parallel to the boom or hooked, then we have less twist. Um, more twist makes the boat more forgiving to steer. And those IC37s, for example, have tall, skinny, keels, tall, skinny rudders. And if you stick it, when I say stick it, if you try to pinch that boat, it literally will go sideways. So it needs to be very forgiving to steer. Where a boat like the J24 or the J22 has a kind of a big, fat, nicely shaped keel that we can trim the main end pretty tight and it'll make the boat point. So it can carry that load. But twist is basically going through the gears. So if we're sailing along, our upper batten is parallel to the boom. And let's say we hit a bunch of motorboat waves and all of a sudden the boat feels like it's dying. We want to shift down a gear real quick, like immediately to first gear and get the boat to accelerate. So we're going to ease the main sheet, induce more twist, which is going to make the boat a little less fragile to steer, I guess you'd say, or fragile to drive, more forgiving to run through the water too. And Remember we talked about the helm, it'll unload the helm so it'll be easier for, for the boat to bear off. All of that, just in one, four inches ease on the main sheet, it'll make a huge difference. So same token, if we get a puff and it's super flat water and we think the boat's going fast and we wanna take advantage of that and pinch it a little bit, we could trim the main end tighter, tighter, tighter reduce that twist and stick it, I guess you'd say pinch a little bit to make the boat point higher. And we're moving into that fourth or fifth gear. Then the boat will start to die because it can't hang there that long. We'll ease the main sheet out, put twist back in the sail and put the bow down and make it accelerate. So, and all this that I'm talking about here is just plain old easing the main in and out you know, depending on the amount of main sheet purchasers and anything like that. But in a, in a lightning, it might be four or five inches and it's gonna make all the difference in the world. On a Flying Scott, you know, it might be three or four inches because of the way it's set up and how it induces the twist. But twist is more, I think if we relate that to gear shifting and making the boat easier to drive, it really helps. Does, so does, yeah, go ahead, Chris. The other question was how tight a groove to use. Tight grooves are great, but hard to drive and stay in the groove. 
Mm, that that is an excellent question. Um, and it's funny, I <clears throat> with these IC 37s, that was one night when we did a webinar, we spent 30 minutes talking about the groove and how the better sailors really kind of feel when they're at the bottom of the groove and when they're at the top of the groove. And those guys have a sort of, I don't want to say easy, but they have a speedo and they have obviously the angle so they can tell when they're bouncing off of the top of the groove because the speed starts going down and they can tell when they're on the bottom of the groove because the boat is going too fast. And this sounded so bizarre to me. They said, we want to be going 7.6 all the time. And I kind of said, you mean like all the time? <laughs> and we're like, what happens once blowing 18? And they said, well, if you're going 8.5, the boat is going too fast for the blades and it won't be able to, it'll slide sideways. So it's interesting to hear him talk like that. So having that feel, that groove is really important. But how does that relate to us? What's that mean to us? And I think making that groove too fine where we're trimming the main end hard all the time makes it really hard to keep the boat going fast, you know? And, you know, in the kind of sailing that we all do so much where it's puffy, shifty, and we're always changing gears, I think setting the boat up so that groove is pretty wide is really important, really helpful. And, and when we're, um, you know, day sailing or cruising or just enjoying a nice sail, setting the boat up with that twist, you know, and maybe trying to keep the boom closer to center and keeping the luffs relatively smooth on both sails would make the boat very easy to steer and keep in that groove. Is that okay? Did I get too, too uh, wound up there on it? <laughs> I, I think you hit it great. Uh, so that okay. was from uh, Chuck, one of our J, uh, Catalina 22 racers. Okay. Okay, so. great. Well, and so that, that's a good question. I think as the extreme to, um, you know, maybe a different situation, it's sim more similar to a Flying Scott or a Lightning, where if the groove is too tight on those boats that we all say on a Catalina 22, of course, would be in that where it's a little heavier and, 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 and it's harder to keep its speed all the time when it's up and down. We need to be able to shift gears quickly to get it down into a lower gear to accelerate. So I think going for that twist is really valuable there. Greg, wouldn't you, wouldn't you want to have a wide groove too if you've got like it's really rough conditions and you're trying to work the boat through waves, makes it easier to steer? Oh yeah, for sure, John. You, um, and, and that's where going back to the balance, actually that's a perfect lead into like sailing in big waves and breeze. The boat has to be, has to be really balanced well where there's very little tug on the tiller because if we hit a wave and we have a lot of weather helm, the wave will want to kick the boat up to weather and we'll fight it hard to keep the boat going straight and drag the rudder through the water and the boat will be really slow. So more twist, a flatter main relative to the jib, like we saw with that IC37, is really, really important. Yeah, we, I'm gonna we found I'm, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was gonna say, we found with these multi hulls that you know, a 2,000 pound boat that's 25 feet long and 18 feet wide, it, it gets pushed around a lot. And if we don't have the power to punch with a, you know, a, a fuller jib and a little bit fuller main, if, if there's any, if there's any breeze, and I mean, we find the same thing in snipes a lot of times too. You know, right. if, it didn't, if you didn't have a wider groove, you weren't going anywhere. Absolutely. Well, and, and you know, and it's funny as sail designs have, have progressed over the years, what has really changed the most, I think, I mean, you know, not speaking to fabrics and, and all that kind of stuff, but just the shape where jibs have gotten much, much rounder in the front. So the depth is much fuller in the front and that makes it a wider groove as, as well. If we have a really, and we're gonna talk about this here in a second, if we have a very flat entry on our jib, which means unlike you know, like a main, if we have too much mass bend, the front end of the jib is flat, the boat will be really difficult to steer. And that fits into that, that wide groove. So now let's, if we get into the jib here, 
looking at this J24, again, we talked about the symmetrical slot and all that kind of stuff, how important that is and what we're looking for. This, unlike the main where we talk about the telltales are gonna stall 70% of the time on the jib, the telltales on the leech should never stall. They should always be flowing because if they're stalled, they're not only telling us that the jib is over trim, they're also telling us that the breeze going between the jib and the main, this slot is shut down. And that is, that's bad news. <laughs> um, and what we kind of would try to teach our college sailors is to pull in the jib so we know we're in the right angle and the white, the right groove for that breeze. We tr if we feel like the boat's tracking well, we trim the jib in till the telltale just starts to stall and then ease it back out till it flows. And um, college boats don't have cleats on the jib, so they're always playing them, sometimes too much, but they're always playing them and they're always looking to have that telltale just flow, but be on the edge. And I think that guide's gonna work on any kind of boat we're sailing, whether it's a J-22, a Catalina 22, a J-24, um, a lightning. Here's a lightning jib. And, and this goes back to your point, Chris, we only have one telltale off the top batten on a lightning and that telltale would flow on the jib and the main. But I wanted to mention here too, the telltales on the left of the jib and um, how they really help us. Obviously they help us steer. And when we're talking about our groove, they tell us when we're in the groove. And when we're in the lower end of the groove, when we're in first gear, the main sheet is eased out. We've got a super balanced helm and we are trying to accelerate. Both telltales will be going straight back, lured and windward like we see here, straight back. When we're in the middle of our groove and our main is the top telltale is is stalling part of the time, the windward telltale would be up at a 45 degree angle. I think I have a picture coming up here, but, um, but it'll be starting to show a stall, which is telling us we're in the, the middle to upper end of our groove. And if it's blowing, John, going back to your condition where it's blowing and you're in a lot of waves and you're trying to keep the boat balanced, both telltales would be stalled going straight up and some of the time the left of the jib would actually be breaking as well. And that's basically taking power out of the main with Boomvang and Cunningham and Traveler and all that stuff to balance the boat. But now we're also taking some power out of the front of the jib. Very important with a Catalina 22 when you guys are at the top end of your Genoa, you know, when it's blowing say 15 or 18 and you know, you're you got to be able to keep the luff smooth with the luff tension. We'll talk about that and actually have the luff break a little bit and balance it. So that tells us our groove. But right now, this is telling us we're in the bottom of the groove in first gear. So well, actually, this, this does show it. So this is a J22 jib. And we see, barely see it here. The lure telltale is straight back. And the windward telltale is up at a... 40 degree, 30 degree angle. Telltale's still flowing off the leech. And I put this here, lead set for break even. So I said these two telltales help a lot as we left, the, to help us set our jib lead position as we left the boat up into the wind. Ideally, these telltales will break at exactly the same time. Okay, that'll tell us our jib leads in the right place. And this is helpful whether we're cruising day sailing or flat out racing, this is a good starting point. Um, but if we're overpowered, like we say here, move it slightly aft so that the top telltale, like we see here, is slightly more stalled than the lower one. And that tells us we've moved the lead back a little bit, which will open the leech up a little bit and flatten the top of the jib and it'll stall up here a little bit before this one, okay? And we see here a little bit of wrinkle along the luff of the jib. And if I was gonna be picky, I'd say that's maybe a little bit too much wrinkle. That would be fine if it's really light air to go with that light air picture we saw. Um, 
of the J24 main earlier where we had wrinkles all the way up. This would be fine for that condition, but it would be too loose for any breeze at all. And I think a lot of us have a tendency to sail with a lot of sag in between our hanks, you know, and I, and I got a picture that I'm going to show you here what that, what that means. Any, any questions on any of this so far? Chris, are we doing okay? So, so I got one question about, um, so one of our thistle sailors asked, he sails a thistle with two people, what's the best way to depower in 12 to 15 and still maintain upwind speed? Ah, okay. Well, it's first, I, uh, I feel your pain. <laughs> a thistle is tricky to sail light and breeze. Um, but what I, the things that I would do, um, obviously outhaul is tight. Um, traveler is down. There's been a move in the thistle to just bolt the traveler in the center of the boat and not move it. But I, I'm still a, I'm a strong believer that letting the traveler down a foot, foot and a half when we're really overpowered is important. Um, vanging as hard as you dare. When, and when I say that, you know, obviously when you're around the top mark, like in a flying Scott, you got to make sure you let the vang off or um, somebody else will take care of that for you because <laughs> the boom will break. But I think making sure you have enough vang on that you're getting those overbend wrinkles and then making sure the cunning ham is on hard. Not so hard all the overbend wrinkles are out, but making sure the cunning ham is on hard is really important. What I think you got to be careful of is making the jib too flat. Like this picture we're looking at here, I say move it slightly aft, kind of going back to what John was saying, sailing in heavy air and lump or sailing when we're trying to balance the boat when the groove is tricky. You know, we don't want to make the jib too flat because it becomes tricky to steer. We still want to have some power in the jib. So I think in the thistle, you know, we only have a few inches we can move the lead back anyway. I would do that, but I would sail with it eased out more. You know, like I would be a good two and a half, three inches off the diamond, you know, easing the sheet so it's twisted open. Going back to that twist stuff we were just talking about, I would ease the jib out quite a bit to get that twist. And then make sure the jib halyard's tight as well. Doesn't have wrinkles like we see in this picture. Um, and then, and then hike like crazy, <laughs> but I hope that helped. But I think the point is both luffs on both sails need to be tight. Jib is eased, but not over flattened. And then the main is vanged hard, traveler down, Cunningham on hard, and then, um, trying to keep the boat as flat as you can. So the second question, um, is, uh, what about adjusting the, jib sheet cars. Oh, and the uh, thistle sailor said, thanks. That's great. Okay. Um, so what about adjusting the jib sheet cars? I think he wants to know more about that lead set that you were uh -huh. talking about on the jib. So mm -hmm. take it away. Yeah, I think, I think on any boat that we're talking about here, even on the Scott, Chris, I think moving the lead back when it gets windy is valuable. I think something that I have learned over the years is that it was, it's very easy to move them back too far, but I think moving it back in the case of a thistle and a flying Scott, you know, the tracks are only so long, moving it to the back of the tracks on those boats is, is helpful. You know, on a Scott moving all the way to the back is important. I think on a thistle moving all the way back is important, but it isn't, um, like on a Catalina 22, you could probably move it back two feet. You only want to move it back so the top of the jib is breaking a little earlier than the bottom, okay? And all we're trying to do is flatten the bottom a little bit of the jib by pulling it more back rather than down and then allowing the top to twist open a little bit, okay? Um, I think, and I hope I don't get too technical here, so, some people have talked about moving the jib lead outboard with barber haulers or whatever, or in the case of a flying Scott, not weather sheeting, you know? And I think the reason we want to keep the jib leads inboard is to develop that twist. If you know what I mean, if we keep the bottom of the jib in closer to center line and we ease the sheet, like we talked about, so the top is more open, we create a lot of twist and the boat's easier to steer. And that would be helpful on a Catalina 22, on a, 
you know, if we we're cruising around day sailing and it was windy, you know, getting that twist in the jib would be helpful and moving the lead back a little bit would be valuable. Okay. Um, any other questions, Chris? Are we all, anything else? We're good for now. Okay. So I'm going to try to get through this four stay sag here because I think this is important. And, um, you know, we talked about on the main how mass bend flattens the sail and we straighten the mast up, it makes it fuller. Well, on the jib, just because we got a big hunk of cloth hanging on the wire up there, it's hard to keep it from sagging. And basically in reverse to the, to the main in heavy air, we're, we're trying to fight the sag from developing too much because as it sags back, it's putting more cloth into the jib and making it fuller. So um, this is why in heavy air, a lot of people tighten their rig tension up a little bit or they put more backstay tension on, or in some classes they pull harder on the jib luff to straighten that force stay so the sag doesn't get too extreme. So um, on a boat like a Catalina 22, the backstay going on hard when it's windy not only makes a big difference in kind of making the main flatten out as much as it's going to, but it'll also keep the sag down to a minimum. In heavy air, that's really important. Snipes, for example, you know, go through quite a range and tightening the rig up when it gets windy and pulling the jib halyard tighter. So the tension on the shrouds might literally double from light air to heavy air to keep the sag to a minimum. But let me show you here what I'm talking about. So this is a Buccaneer jib, just a one design jib like all of us are used to looking at. It's not much different in size between a, um, to a Flying Scott, for example. Now, uh, right away, I wanna say the cloth tension is too loose. So I'm embarrassed a little bit by this picture because this is a uh, goofus and gallant. This one's a little bit too loose and the wrinkle should be much smaller, but this will help exaggerate what I'm going to show you here. If we did a straight line from the head to the tack down here, we could see, and you can see the sag in here, you know, maybe an inch and a half of sag. Now this guy is going to really pull hard on the wire in his jib and straighten the luff. Same jib, same condition, same guy laying on the deck, taking a picture up the foot. Look at the difference in the shape of the jib and how flat this is now in the front. This is much rounder, fuller, more forgiving, right? So we've got to be careful in light to medium air that we don't over flatten the jib by taking all that head stay sag out. And um, so does that make sense? So, um, you know, Chris on the Flying Scott, the snug rig is kind of the way many people are setting the boats up now there was a time that we had gone to a tight rig, which was super tight and there was very little sag and it was fast and heavier, but it was incredibly slow, not slow, it was tricky to sail and lighter. So that's why we got away from it. Now we're going with a snug rig jib. So we get this kind of sag and light air. Okay. Does yeah, I'll just sense? say, I love my snug rig jib. Man, the groove is wide and I can almost always find it. Yeah, that's important. And, and so this gives you an idea. So just to back up a little bit, just to belabor this, and I apologize, if we feel like we're sailing upwind and the groove is really narrow and we're really struggling to keep the boat tracking, you know, and we think we got the main right, the helm's balanced, I would look and make sure that we don't have the rig too tight or too much backstay on or too much jib halyard tension on and the sag is completely taken out. You know, I said in heavy air, we don't want to have too much sag, but in light air, we don't want to have too little sag and it'll make the jib look like that. And this would be just an impossible jib to steer well upwind. And, um, and the groove would be incredibly narrow. You can see here in this picture, I don't know if you can see it, this telltale, the lured telltale is stalled. And I don't think I ever said it when we were talking telltales before, but never, ever, ever do you want the lured telltale stalled when you're sailing upwind. If you look at the different, oh, I was hoping that one wouldn't be stalled like that. <laughs> but anyway, that gives you an idea on the groove, okay? 
Any questions on luff sag? So we talked about little boats and I use those. Yeah, Chris. One question was what about adjustments for roller furling jibs? Mm, okay. Well, um, ideally roller furler jibs are cut to match the amount of sag. And I guess you'd say the lack of sag that they're gonna get in light air. So they're a little, actually this kind of leads right in perfect to this next picture because this jib on this J120 is a roller furler. So it's interesting. I'll go right there right now. Um, so they're cut for that. So you really don't have to think too much about it or worry about the rig tension. But what does become important is the cloth tension. You know, on a roller furler, usually they go up inside a tunnel or there's an adjustment to adjust the cloth tension. And on this J120 here, we see these wrinkles and it's blowing pretty hard. I think it was blowing like 18 to 20 this day. And he's got a fancy, you know, radial Genoa that, so it's not gonna stretch much, but we see these big wrinkles along the left. And remember we talked about trying to make the exit of the jib, whether it's a jib or a Genoa and the entry of the main match. And if we look here, look how it gets really tight right here, really round. And that is only because the luff is loose on the jib here. So if he cranked his halyard up, even though it's a furler, cranked it up a little tighter so that the cloth tension was tighter and the luff was smoother, this would straighten right out and two things would happen. One, the boat would be easier to steer and the boat would balance better and second, because this was a little more open, a little straighter, not closed to the main like we see here, he could trim the jib a little tighter and actually go a little higher and a little faster. Okay. So I hope that, so on a furler again, just to go back, you don't have quite the opportunity to adjust the, the um, rig tension. I, I, let me take that back. On a boat like this 120 where they're racing, they will adjust the rig tension from light to heavy air, but it's not gonna be quite the range and sag like we'd see in other boats, but the cloth tension on the left becomes really important. Okay, does that, that answer that okay? Okay, this is um, the J121. Okay, and, and again, if there are any other questions, or if we get away from that and somebody says, that really didn't make sense, you know, please don't hesitate to ask it again. This just shows a J121 with the luff nice and smooth. You can see a little bit of wrinkle here. And the, the leech of the jib is, it's hard because we're not all the way at the back, but the leech exit of the jib is parallel symmetrical with the entry of the main. And you can see this is pretty light air, obviously. The outhaul is pretty tight. So that was before we stopped and sat for an hour. <laughs> Any questions before we get into near the end? And I got a couple little boat handling stuff, but anybody have any sail trim questions at this point? And, and we can come back to it. It's not like you said, Chris, we can do more at the end. I, I wanna talk just a second about tacks. And this is a roll tack. Now, obviously most of the boats were sailing we aren't gonna roll tack like this, but this is a 420. This is one of our best sailors, an all American from Southern California. And he's doing a roll, a beautiful roll tack here. And there's some things, whether it's an FJ and you're roll tacking or it's a Catalina 22 and we're going through our tack that I wanted to describe here. One, um, he heads up into the tack pretty darn slow. And I think this is important no matter what kind of boat we're sailing a lot of people would jam the helm over hard to make the boat turn real fast. And my point here is that you don't wanna create any gurgle. You don't wanna drag the rudder. You don't wanna stall the rudder by jamming it hard. And we, and we can see the wake is flat here. And he hasn't really rolled the boat until he actually starts to cross the eye of the wind like we see here, okay? One thing else I wanna notice we talked about trimming the sails to help the boat turn. And to be honest with you, this is gonna be probably 
even more valuable to day sailors and cruisers is when we want to tack, trim in the main end to make the boat want to turn up into the wind is super helpful. Um, so what Jake has done here in this FJ is trim the main end real, real hard. You can see the leech is tight on the main to make the boat turn up into the wind. And then when he crosses the eye of the wind, he'll obviously ease it out, but he'll also ease it out to first gear. So in a Flying Scott, actually in a Flying Scott, Chris, it's really valuable because you think about it, you're sailing along and the boom is pretty far off center line, you know, if there's any wind at all. And when we start to head up into the wind, if you think about it, the boom will, the main will start luffing pretty early before we get close to close haul or close to head to wind. But if we trim it in, two things happen. One, it helps the boat turn up and there's less luffing. Less luffing means less drag. So that's part of the tack. Slow into the turn, trim the main to make the boat head up. And then when we come out, and this is a part I wanted to mention for everybody, and we've all been there before. We come out of the tack and either the boat continues to bear off and woo, it heels way over and we almost fall down to lured, or at least I fall down to lured, you know, <laughs> and it's hard to keep the boat balanced and tracking, or we cross the eye of the wind and it's like, it's hard to get the boat down and going again, especially in breeze, it's really hard. And what I think we're seeing there is the boat is out of balance again, simply. So what I, what I would urge us to try and practice is it's pretty easy to know where we want the jib to be, right? We know on a um, thistle, for example, the leech is gonna be two to three inches off the spreader when we come out of a tack. In a Flying Scott, that upper batten is gonna be angled outboard maybe 20, 25 degrees when we're first accelerating. On a Catalina 22, the top of the jib will be pretty open as we're trying to accelerate. But the part that is gonna match that is the trim on the main. And so this puts it back on the driver or the person trimming the main. If the person on the main eases it out too far for that jib trim, then the jib will pull the bow down and the boat will heel over more. You know what I mean? If on the other hand, we tack and we can't get the bow down and we're just sitting there struggling to get through the eye of the wind and on the new tack, that means the skipper or the main sheet trimmer didn't ease the main out enough. And, you know, it's, and I think it's really hard to just say, ease the main out this much or ease it only this much. You know, I think you got to do a few tacks in that condition to really get comfortable with it. It's really worth going through that. And so I put this in because Jake here, the jib's eased out just the right amount to make the boat accelerate, but he's eased the main out to match the jib so that the helm is right down the center again. And then once they get up to speed, the crew will trim the jib in again and he'll trim the main end to match, okay? But this applies you know, it was interesting even watching those IC-37s when they would tack and the main sheet trimmer didn't ease, they would just sit there head to wind. They couldn't get the boat going. Or if the main sheet trimmer kind of lost it and it got away from them a little bit and they tacked and the jib filled, but the main was eased, then they bore off like 15 degrees and were on their side. So it's interesting. Doesn't matter what kind of boat we're in, that balance initially out of the tack is really helpful. So. So here we are near the end. Um, and I just was gonna say, I think even in the kind of sailing that we all do, shifty, puffy, up and down, tricky, like this, this shot here shows, look at the boat up here to weather, like 40 degrees higher than the boats to leeward. And this boat's down even relative to, you know, it's all over the place. But one common consistent goal we can have is to be as fast as we can be all the way around the race course. Then that allows us to be as conservative as we can be. And if we miss a shift or two, we can still be in the top of the group and then make our move, I guess you'd like to say at the end. So being able to sail conservatively will only be able to happen if we're sailing fast and we're going through the gears. Um, I, We all know we like to stand up on the seat on our boat and look up the breeze and see what's coming next. And um, 
try to decide what side of the course we should sail towards, where the next puff is coming from. Um, sometimes it's too easy to become dazed and confused by all that. <laughs> but I think really, if we, I don't mean to make light of it because obviously we wanna get a good idea where the next puff's coming and we wanna to try to do the best we can to stay in phase, but we can't always be there, you know? So I think being as fast as we can be and protecting, when we sail conservative, we protect ourselves against the masses of boats. That is, make sure that we kind of basically keep ourselves between the, our, the main mass of our competition and the weather mark, you know, that's kind of the goal. And that way we'll get whatever they get, we'll lose whatever they lose, but we won't lose the mass. Sometimes things don't go always as we plan. <laughs> this is a, a 49er, one of the boats that's in the Olympics. Fortunately, this is not one of our US guys, but sometimes it doesn't always go great, but we always wanna make sure we're having a great time. Um, these were two of our best sailors on our women's team. And the girl driving actually went to the Olympics um, in Rio in this class of boat and was 10th her very first time in the Olympics. And she is a senior at the College of Charleston this year. It's pretty cool. But no matter what level you're sailing at, you got to make sure you have fun. And when you have fun, that's when it all comes together and things go really well. <laughs> so enjoy your sailing. And again, here's my phone number and email address. And, um, and if I could just take one second, I, 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 again, I think Chris mentioned at the beginning what I'm doing now, it's kind of interesting. I was a sailmaker before um, with my own company and then North Sales for 35 years. And then I changed careers and became the director at the College of Charleston and all that. Now I'm back being a sailmaker again with this new company called Evolution Sales. So Anyway, I'm excited about it. I'm proud of it. And this group does sales, maxi boat sales, like we see the boat on the left. And then we go all the way down to little boats like college boats and everywhere in between. And we do a lot of repair. So if you need anything fixed, let us know. But again, if there's any questions at all, and there's my phone number, my email address, please don't hesitate to reach out. And, and um, if we have any questions, any more questions hey, now, I'm, in, I'm into it. I got a couple questions for you. So. Um, Kind of right at the end of your discussion about the jib, jib trim and jib positioning was what about leech lines? So I think this ah, is coming from okay. a bigger boat and uh, so leech lines. Yeah, well, that, it's interesting, um, you know, and we do have leech lines in a lot of little boats, like even a lightning has a leech cord in the main. And um, it's interesting. It is the very last adjustment would go to. Um, to, to, so when the leech starts fluttering, if we go pull on the leech cord more than it needs, we can really do damage to the sail. And let me see if I can explain why. So, you know, the, the sail is going to stretch kind of no matter what, right? Just e even a, a fancy, this is a, um, it's called an element membrane carbon sail. It's eventually going to stretch a little bit, but obviously not like a 420 sail here on the right. But when the leech cord is tight, that won't stretch. So the sail in front of that leech cord will stretch. And then when we are done in that heavier condition and we let the leech cord off, the sail is still stretched in front of the leech cord. So I would try to avoid um, the leech cord until it's a, so noisy, it really bugs you. <laughs> B, it's, you can tell it's, it's actually going to do damage to the sail. And B, it's actually like shaking the sail. This sounds crazy coming from a sailmaker, but I think we just got to be careful about overdoing it. And I know there are people that get so nervous when they see the, the leech flutter um, because they think it's really going to slow down the speed of the boat and the height of the boat, you know, the ability for the boat to point. But I think um, if we overdo the leech cord too early, it can really be dangerous to the length or the durability of the sail. We had a, um, it's called a Code Zero, which is a very lightweight, it's like a cross between a spinnaker and a jib on this J121 that I was on. 
and somebody had accidentally put the leech cord on early in its life too tight. And this thing, I've never, it curled, I'm not exaggerating, like a foot. And when we would let it off, so the curl would go away because it had stretched so much in front, the last foot and a half would, would luff, would flap. So um, you just got to be careful about not putting the leech cord on until you need to. And truly, you know, when it's really flapping, so it's shaking the sail, um, too noisy. <laughs> And, um, you know, and you can tell it's actually doing, you, you can see that it's fluttering in more than two inches, then a little leech cord is good. And I didn't mean to get off on a tangent there, but I think, um, I think it is important to be really careful of not overdoing it. So I got another one for you. Um, Greg, you keep referring to gears. He understands the usage of the term, but can you explain when you feel you are in first, second, third, or if it's not based on the number like that, but instead in transitioning points of sale, et cetera? Oh, that's a great question because that's, that's the name of the game. You know, and it's, if you could relate it to a car in the days when we all, you know, shifted by hand and we would get to a light and we would forget to shift from second or third to first, and, or at least I used to do that all the time and try to leave a light and the car would shake and we couldn't get the thing up to, speed it's very much like that in a um in a boat that if we have the um if we're well let, let, let's back up if we come off the starting line and we're sitting there luffing the sails trying to set ourselves up to start um, or we're leaving a dock and we're getting ready to go and our sails are luffing and we push off or we trim in to start and we go immediately to that upper batten trim parallel to the boom where that telltale is stalled and our telltale or windward telltale and our jib is just up and our jib is trimmed in. We went immediately to say third gear. The boat will not have the boat's going to like buck, but what it'll do instead of buck is literally load up and go sideways. So we have to allow the boat to build speed to get water flow over the blades, whether it's a keel, you know, like a, like a, Catalina 22 or a J22, or it's the board on a Thistle or a Flying Scott. We've got to get that flow over it before the boat can, can move. So going through the gears like that becomes really important. And, you know, when we talk about feel in a boat, I think that's what we're referring to is obviously the feel on the helm. If we have weather helm, then we know the rudder has load on it, so it's going to stall a lot quicker, and that will maybe tell us we're in the wrong gear, but the boat will load up and slide sideways. So the feel that we have is going to tell us what gear we should be in. And if, and let me add one more thing that I think is incredibly helpful for me when I'm racing is I always have somebody, um, and if we're sailing with two people, then my other crew, my wife would be looking at the other boat we're sailing alongside of and tell me what gear I'm in. She's also calling puffs. She's also saying the boats on the right are headed, I hope, or maybe she'll say, don't look now, but they're lifted or, you know, whatever it is, she's constantly feeding that information in, but she would also be saying, we are sailing hopefully faster and higher. Or she might say, we're lower and slower and that would tell me I'm in the wrong gear. Or if she would say we're higher and slower, that would tell me I'm trying to point the boat too much and I'm in too tight a gear. So having that relative information, I think is really important. So even if we're in a Catalina 22 and we're racing, you know, um, perf or whatever rule we're using, you know, still, kind of getting an idea of looking at other boats, how we're doing with them becomes really important. That helps us get our feel and get in the right gear. Okay, I got two related questions on Genoa track. So the first is, when do you use the outside Genoa track? And the second is on the outside Genoa track, when do you position the block forward or toward the stern? Oh, good questions. Um, many boats these days have designed the sails the Genoas, the jibs, so they're always on the inboard track. 
And the idea is that you move the lead back a little bit, like we talked about, you know, maybe in the, the big, big boats, maybe it's going to be a couple, three inches. In a flank scot, a thistle, a lightning, it might just be an inch and a half, two inches by the time we get to the back of the track. Um, we will move the lead back to flatten the bottom of the jib. But by keeping the lead inboard where, um, let me see if I can get here, okay. This J121, there is a lot of area below the boom where the jib is overlapping. So by keeping on an inboard track there, we can carry fullness, power in the jib, ease the jib sheet like we talked about, or when the lead moves back, we'll twist the top of the jib open like we talked about in heavy air when we were talking about say on in, in heavy air and chop and everything like that. But we can still carry a lot of power in the bottom of the jib. So my goal, my, my guide would be if we have a lot of backwind, when we've eased the Genoa a little bit, then we would need to go the outboard track. And when I say backwind, I mean backwind in the lower part of the main. That would tell us we need to go the outboard track. And once we go to the outboard track, I would use that guide that we described with the telltales, high and low. I would slowly luff up and see the top telltales break before the bottom if it was windy. And that would tell us that, that that part of the jib will be a little more twisted open and, and not backwind as much. But I would try to avoid going outboard on the track because we give up power and pointing ability. Um, and again, the guide to tell us that we need to do that if we have to would be the backwind and the main down low. Okay, I got one last question for you, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, can you give a recap on using the sails to steer the boat? Sure. Um, <clears throat> when we want to bear off, remember we talked about balance, you know, and, and when we got really technical, we said a fuller jib and a flatter main would make the boat want to bear away from the wind. Or we said if we wanted to head up, we would ease the jib or flatten the jib and trim the main, and that would head the boat up. So that, that's the technical part of it, and that'll balance the boat so it'll go through the water the fastest. But if we want to just plain bear off, you know, let's say, and we want to, or head up, let's say first, let's say we want to head up to get to our mooring and we're below it, we would perhaps ease the jib out, let the jib luff and trim the main in. And that would help the boat turn up to the wind without slowing it down. So we can coast a lot better. But let's say there's a dock in front of us and we're aiming at this dock and we need to bear away from it quickly, let's say. So we could trim the jib in tighter, let the main out, the jib will pull the bow down faster, the main being out will let the stern basically move up to windward and the boat bear away. And we won't have to fight it with the rudder. So the rudder will basically follow behind the boat because we've loaded up the front of the boat with the jib being in tight, which will pull the bow down. And the main is eased out. So the pressure in the back of the boat is minimized. So it'll bear off all by itself. And, and taking this to a, a racing point, you know, when we're bearing off to go behind somebody that's on starboard, let's say, and we're on port, and we want to do a nice clean duck, we don't want to fight by pulling the rudder hard over our head because we're going to slow the boat down as we're going at them. Plus, going back to that safety stuff, it makes it really hard to dip them. But if we ease the main five or six or eight inches so that that unbalances the boat and lets the jib pull us down, we'll keep our speed up, go right behind them, then trim the main back in when we go behind them and we'll be back up on our close hold course. Did that make sense? Did to me. So I've gotten a lot of comments that this was really great um, and that we've all really enjoyed it. The, the best comment that I had was it's just there. The person is really frustrated that now that he's got all this stuff, he can't rush right out to the lake and, and uh, <laughs> try it because of the weather. So lots of very good Greg's and thank you to you. And, um, and I will just say on behalf of Cave Run Sailing, thank you so much for giving your time tonight. 
this was wonderful. And I, I can tell you, I learned a lot. And I think based on the comments that I'm seeing, um, wonderful presentation, wonderful uh, information, and, and we think it's just fantastic. So thank you, thank you so, so much, Greg. We really appreciated it. Well, thanks, Chris. And again, if anybody has any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm, I'm glad to help and talk anytime. Great. You guys take care and have a good winter and uh, hopefully we get through this and we're all sailing together next spring. Right. Pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thanks. Thanks, Greg.